As we go through these discussions, I'm not just trying to discuss the history of, of motorsport and just kind of blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to relate it also to those key stakeholders, and we're going to showcase how they've evolved over time, especially after World War II. I'm also trying to showcase the social studies, and so trying to incorporate history, so U.S. history or global history, and try to incorporate those uh, uh, subject areas as we explore the history of motorsport. So we have to understand what's going on. World War II, obviously conflict after it. That's when the United States became the global economic superpower. So we came back from uh, World War II, all the GIs, mostly young males. A lot of them were tinkerers, were, were engineers, were, were working on planes, uh, were essentially you know, coming up with aviation technology, different ways in which to make things go faster. So they brought a lot of that expertise that they acquired back home and started tinkering with their own cars. Further, they had money, so they could afford to tinker and they could afford to buy cars. And so now you have increasing participants. So you can really see how this increasing participation then led to more spectators, blah, blah, blah. And so what we're also going to see is a flourishing a number of sanctioning bodies or forms of racing. So really stock car racing, although it originated before World War II, it really took off after World War II. Drag racing, no doubt it became uh, much more popular after World War II, although it was also, or, or you know, it had origins there in the 1930s. And so essentially after World War II, if we think about culturally, economically, historically, this is right when the United States was perfect for the growth of, in this case, motorsport, as more and more people not only had access to cars, but could then race those cars, could afford to race those cars, could afford to wreck those cars cars and so on. And once again, I'm going to tie it back to our production distribution cons consumption model of motorsports. So we think about the production side, constructors and suppliers, oil related companies definitely st started uh, to invest heavily in motorsport. Uh, spark plugs, you add in dealerships. You look at a lot of the sponsors of cars were car dealerships, um, which was at the time, you know, that was you know, people buying their first ever car or, or, or are now having the ability to buy a brand new car. Of course, car dealerships are going to be a heavily involved. You also look at the events. Of course, events and entrance, this all kind of go hand in hand as there's more cars, as there's more race cars, as there's more race car drivers, it becomes more uh, race car teams and events and so on. We're also going to see the number of sanctioning bodies, number of regulators of the sport. You know, it's cool that we're now drag racing. Uh, it's cool that we're playing chicken. It's cool that we're having all this kind of this 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 you know, street uh, kind of illegal uh, racing. Let's organize it. Let's actually have regulation. Uh, you know, if I took my race car to go race at a race, uh, you know, in a different state, let's have some standardized rules so that I could take my. And we're going to be fair. Uh, so sanctioning bodies start to really, you know. Uh, um, to, to develop. You then have the role of media. Media change. Of course, television played a key role, radio at the time, uh, but newspapers and continue to, to, to evolve. But do newspapers still have a role today? I don't know. Not so much. But this is definitely when newspaper uh, coverage of, of, of racing uh, really grew along with later on, as I'll discuss, television. Essentially, consumption, we think about consumption is what drives the sport. No doubt consumption grew big time, uh, leading up to the to, to what we'll later talk about, the glory years of racing. And so the number of people watching racing, the number of people seeing a car go by them super fast for the first time, that hair-raising experience that all of us know so well, the first time uh, was really happening during this boom uh, after World War II. All this leads, of course, to more money. More money means more innovation. And so we see the role of what we're going to later talk about, the space age. Uh, and so this, this, this space race was really fueled on our economic boom after World War II. Uh, that also led to innovation. And we're going to talk about how we uh, one innovation was in the case of IndyCar racing, uh, in case of open wheel uh, car racing in the United States was moving the engine from the, from the front to the rear of the vehicle. Although I wish I had time to talk about all the various forms of racing and its history uh, in the United States, I'm going to be mostly focusing in on the national or global level. So looking at you know IndyCar, a little bit of NASCAR, and here and there some NHRA, some big picture drag racing. So mostly going to be looking at our elite or national level series in this focus on post World War II motorsport. 
Now, we don't have a lot of academic research on motorsport, but one example of some good academic research is this guy's PhD thesis from the University of Bournemouth, United Kingdom. I looked at the evolution of motorsport sponsorship over time. And a lot of this relates to stuff we've already talked about. So beforehand, we looked at before World War II, we all looked at the whole win on Sunday, or you know, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So the idea that motorsport was very crucial to the automobile industry, especially early on for reliability, for speed, for all that testing, but also to kind of separate the good ideas from the bad ideas. And so if your idea won, of course, then you had a more likely chance of your automobile actually being produced and people actually wanting to consume it. So that's that whole idea as far as the marketing of vehicles by manufacturing to help, you know, will win on Sunday. And that competition or racing event helped to identify your product as being superior to another person's product. Over time, though, not only do we have the constructors, but we have the suppliers getting involved. So we have Firestone, we've got uh, spark plugs, oil uh, uh, you know, companies start becoming more invested in, in racing. Uh, well, then we see outside this red box, which I'll talk about later, we've got some other elements. And so what this is, is more a flow chart, kind of this happened, then this happened, and so on. And so what this is basically saying is the invention of the car led to then over time competition between early manufacturers who then were trying to then sell, market to their product, and then over time piggybacking on top of that was other auto related sponsors that were then uh, use a racing event to showcase their product. And we can see that in different illustrations here in uh, newspapers, newspaper clippings, and advertisements. And so we have uh, from the 1909 Indianapolis Star, uh, you know, advertising the fact they won all these various uh, races at the Speedway. Uh, this was national, the national brand, which uh, was obviously here, uh, you know, produced the national car. Another advertisement from 1909 that we see in the Indianapolis Stars from Michelin. Tires win as usual, once again showcasing uh, that they have a product superior to other tire manufacturers. You ever see another advertisement uh, from uh, more recently, would say from the 50s and 60s, it's showcasing the role of, of Valvoline, oil manufacturers, once again, using motorsport to showcase their product, showcase their product and differentiate it from other brands. Now this is one where you have, it's not really related to the automobile. I mean, you don't need a helmet to or a car to go. Uh, to go. Uh, you, all, you know, you do need tires, uh, you do need a spark plug, you do need some oil, uh, you do need obviously a car. So it makes sense that, you know, National, Marmon, Michelin, uh, Firestone, Champion Spark Plugs, Mobile Oil were involved. But then Bell Helmets, it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, and so this speaks to a few different things. It kind of speaks to you know, this non, I would say, related to a, a car going uh, sponsorship. Uh, so Bell Helmets, and this speaks to a few different things. First off, it speaks to the fact that we have increasing participation in motorsports. And so we have more people driving race cars. And so that means more people buying helmets. And so Bell Helmets really wouldn't, sur it wouldn't survive. Right? It wasn't like you had this huge demand for racing helmets back uh, in the 19-teens and 1920s. But as it really boomed, of course you did. Uh, so Bell Helmets definitely then tried to use racing to sell their product uh, to grow amongst participants. Also, you have more people, would say, riding Harleys. Uh, riding motorcycles and so once again even though they might be not be race car drivers but that economic boom that we had and after uh, world war ii also meant more people had motorcycles not only did they have that car but they also had that motorcycle because uh, they could now afford it and discuss auto racing and sponsorship especially when we think about those automotive companies stp and very important Andy Granatelli are absolutely critical. They changed the game. Uh, like most things, it's usually an individual or a few individuals who are the game changers. So we look at sponsorship in auto racing, in motorsport. It was, you know, it was around, you know, definitely useful, but overwhelmingly manufacturers, Ford, Chevy, whomever, what are the keys to helping a car get on track as far as funding? We look at in the case of products, by gosh, STP were the innovators. And so we can see the top left, Andy Granatelli, he's up there in the middle. Uh, there's Andy. Uh, and so this 
particular outfit, I actually have, I own a pair of these overalls, uh, in which the STP logo, Andy Granatelli was the CEO of STP, his company. So he wanted to take his company, he wanted to take it and go global. They want to go big time. They're kind of fledgling business, an oil treatment company. Uh, so he wanted to make it go bigger. Um, so to do that, he saw automobile uh, racing as a great way to showcase their product that obviously is used in automobiles. And of course, with more people using cars, it makes sense. Well, why not get this? Because you're going to actually maybe use STP in their own car. So this this particular idea of having a very bright color with this day glow orange, which is kind of hard to see in this image, uh, with that logo smacked right on top of it, even further having the crew with this STP logo all over, essentially he's creating a spectacle. That's what he was. He was essentially a guy who was just trying to make a spectacle, make eyeballs, stare at this car, and guess what they also stare at? They stare at that logo. And so what he really did was he invested in auto racing, and then from that, his company grew. Uh, we also see STP's involvement in uh, NASCAR and stock car racing. Uh, the very famous uh, Richard Petty and his uh, particular car, is a combination of petty blue and that day glow orange. And so Andy Granatelli also came to NASCAR in the early 70s and saw, oh, well, well, you know, why not invest in NASCAR as well? And so that became a partnership that it was very much characterized in the 70s and 80s as far as dominating before Dale Earnhardt was around. Richard Petty in this particular car, the 43 with the STB sponsorship, overwhelmingly won. And so because of that, people knew about it. So here I was in 1980s, a little kid, and I was playing with the STP race car. That was my favorite one. It was cool looking, and it always won. I love looking at photos because we can break down a lot of things that we've talked about and hopefully relate them to what we see. And so this is from the 1965 Belgium Grand Prix at a racetrack called Spa, and it's probably one of the most famous corners in racing, uh, Eau Rouge, that we see here, this dip. And we can really see, first off, how much the safety advancements. I mean, look at this. this I mean, <laughs> these people, uh, not only the drivers are risking their lives, uh, but look at the spectators and the people trying to grab that super photo in the wet conditions on a downs, uh, downs, uh, uh, downhill a corner here where I don't know about tires, but these are uh, probably not the uh, best rain tires we've got. These are pretty gutsy. But anyway, back to the lecture at hand. We've got uh, you know some sponsors we see here. And once again, we can really see those automotive sponsors. And I'm not saying that after World War II, the automotive sponsors disappeared. In fact, it's the opposite of what I'm saying. So we really see the growth and the evolution of them really during this time period, especially as more and more people are watching racing. Look at all those spectators. And so what a great time to showcase your brand, showcase your product. Uh, than uh, an event in which you get all these eyeballs, all these spectators. Uh, also, what we see here is we do see rear engine cars. Um, so the engines are in the rear. For more on this whole rear engine revolution, this whole rear engine, front engine thing I'm talking about, uh, check out this article uh, that's included called The Day the Dinosaur Died. Uh, it's by Dean Case. And it's about Dan Gurney in 1963 bringing his new idea, a rear engine car, uh, which definitely transformed Indianapolis Motor Speedway in terms of open wheel cars racing there. You look behind them, you can see a front engine car. So just to familiarize yourself or to uh, explain uh, uh, something that you maybe have never heard of, this whole rear engine revolution. Another way to showcase the advancements of technology in this kind of, the, well, hell, we got all this money now, let's spend it on stuff. Uh, it was kind of great to make the car go faster than ever before, let's break that record, is this uh, particular car here that ran in the 1967 Indianapolis 500, this car that dominated the race and almost won. Uh, but that's a story that you can look up on Wikipedia. More about this car is essentially a gas turbine engine. So it's essentially an engine that was uh, designed for air airplanes uh, uh, was strapped to uh, this car, and essentially the driver is like a sidecar almost there on the on the right hand side uh, on this kind of mid level engine. And this was essentially an engine that was designed for airplanes that was strapped to his to a race car. And of course, it dominated. Now, it had all kinds of issues, all kinds of hiccups, uh, did all kinds of bad things to it, especially in testing. Uh, but nonetheless, it showcases this space age, this idea of using new technologies, aviation, bringing all these ideas to make a car go faster than ever beforehand. And what did that do? Did that pique the interest of people? Did that make people want to go out to the racetrack to see this thing? And more importantly, to hear this thing? You bet your bottom dollar. 
Here's a U-tube from Goodwood of the uh, U of the uh, turbine gas turbine engine. This is from 1968, so it's a uh, uh, after uh, the previous one. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see that sound. But we can also see some of the technologies. Uh, look at the aerodynamics. It's got that wedge shape, very much distinctive uh, a shape. With, I mean, that looks so much like a wedge there at the nose. Uh, and so this goes back. You know, obviously predates wings, but we think about it at the time. You know, the 60s. We're launching rockets in the sky for the first time ever, using all these new materials, lightweight materials, uh, learning all these things about thrust and aerodynamics, this, that, and the other. Uh, and so we can see that translate over into motorsport as well at the time. So once again, I'm not going to do an you know, engineering lesson, but nonetheless, we can hear uh, the turbine engine and kind of see why people would be interested in it, why spectators and viewers uh, would be interested in Get the dolly out of the way. Uh, but uh, this is this is just the gas turbine uh, that became quite popular there, uh, and it's still very popular amongst baby boomers, older people. Listen to the sound difference of that same period of this rear engine car. Much different sound. Yeah.